parking right here. I don't believe I'm gonna leave these things. I don't know about that. Oh mercy. But have you met a believer before that looks like he's been sucking on one of them? And just they just hate the life and the passion. It all not to be that way. Thank you for being here tonight. It's good to see you and trust things are going well. This is a good crowd. We talked last night's crowd, didn't we? So we're so we're ending on a high note, preacher. And we're glad for that. I appreciate your preacher. He's a good man. And I'll tell you, he's been a really, really good friend to me uh, since I went into evangelism. I've had several men that have rallied around me. And I know this is a secular term, but I can't think of a better one, so I'm going to use it anyway. Have promoted me since I've been this. And you know what? Evangelism, unfortunately, it's like anything else. Brother Earl, you agree with this, that it's, it's who you know. It is it's who you know. And uh, uh, I'm trying to, I, I don't sit back in my house and wait for meetings to drop in my lap. I don't do that. Anytime God gives me a meeting, it's by faith. And for instance, if I make a phone call and I introduce myself to a preacher, and he says, hey, we'd love to have you come. God still gave me the meeting. God still the one gets the honor and glory. I just put feet to my faith and made the phone call. And uh, that's why I'm in the process of doing it. God's been so very good. Uh, thank you folks for your attention last night. You listened so well. And you know what? Your preacher's got a brilliant scheme in mind. You sing one hymn, get the preacher started about 7.15, and we'll get out of here a little bit after 8. He had, he had the plan, or he was a man with the plan, and he hit right on last night, and so we're glad for it. We're glad that you're here. I'm going to try to sing for you tonight, uh, if that's okay. Uh, you know, there's a lot of songs that have been written about heaven. Aren't you glad that heaven's our home? You know, actually, heaven's our home now. Did you know that? Yeah. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation." is in heaven and the word conversation there doesn't mean chit chat it means citizenship and so if you put that word in the text it does no harm to it for our citizenship is in heaven so 1383 craig robertson road southeast roanoke virginia 24014 is where i reside but where i remain is heaven that's my residence we really are when we sing the song this world is not my home i'm just passing through that's a biblical truth we are aliens and pilgrims and sojourners in this world. We're in the world, but Jesus said in John 17, we're not of it. And so we're glad for that. And we're glad that you're here tonight. A lot of songs written by heaven. And any of you like the Gaithers, about like the Gaither music? I love Southern Gospel music. I believe it's the music of heaven. And if you don't agree, you're wrong. All right? <laughs> I should say that, you know. And uh, I love that. And uh, they, they sing this song, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. I'm going to give me a swallow of water for I'm a heavy drinker. Now, I didn't explain what that means, all right? I'm heavy. I weigh none of your business. That's how many pounds I weigh. And I drink a lot. That makes me a heavy drinker, all right? So don't panic. Hope it'll be a blessing to you. Somewhere just beyond the Jordan River is a place of everlasting joy and peace where the tree of life is blooming there forever and the crown of life is waiting there for me that sounds like
No pain, no disappointments there to hurt us. And Jesus Christ himself will be the light that sounds like home to me. How about you? Yeah. Right where I want to be, there will be no tears to fill our eyes again. The hills will echo with the story as we sing of His grace and glory where the same. Of God will be that sounds like home to me. The hills will echo with the story as we sing of His grace and glory where you and I will be. That sounds like Sounds like home to me. Well, take your Bible this evening if you will and turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and we're glad that you're here tonight. And uh, it's wonderful to have Pastor Earl Clemens and his wife with us here. A uh, few men in ministry do I respect brother, better more than Brother Earl. Uh, brother Earl was uh, a real friend to me many years back when I was transitioning between one ministry to another and uh, entrusted me with the pulpit of Gospel Light Baptist Church on I believe two occasions and uh, we had a wonderful time there and I uh, thank a lot of my dear brother and he is a glutton for punishment because he came to hear me preach tonight and uh, but we're glad that he and his dear wife are here supporting the meeting and I know that he's a friend of Montville Baptist Church and we're glad that he's here tonight. We're Mark 10. I want to draw your attention to a familiar portion of scripture and again, I hope it will be a blessing to you. I won't make you turn there again tonight, but I want to remind you of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, of his purposes, of his mindset, the way that he thinks. And again, not here to sensationalize the devil, to glorify him, or to give him his moment in the sun. We're here to understand him and know how our enemy thinks, so that we can avoid the pitfalls and the trappings and the snares of the devil. And Paul said, we're not ignorant of how he operates. Hey, big boy, we're on to you. We understand that you're more powerful than we are in our flesh. And you're wiser and smarter and more experienced and most assuredly more powerful. But we're believers. We've been saved by the grace of God. We've repented of our sin. We've realized that we're sinners and believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again for us. Therefore, we've been placed in the family of God. Amen. Therefore, the Holy Spirit resides within us Amen. and seals us, and He's the earnest of our salvation. And therefore, God's more powerful than you are. Amen. And so we rest the battle of Satan in His hands, but you need to understand that we are on to you. And although His toys have changed and His technology has changed, His mode of operation has not. And one of the main things that He loves to use in the Bible believing and teaching local church, just like Montgomery Baptist, is discouragement. Discouragement. Where God's people, they're saved, they're on their way to heaven, but excitement has been replaced with apathy. Hey, positivity and faith has been re replaced with cynicism and world weariness. Where we get so sick and tired of all the evil around us, it's all we talk about. And it's all we think about. You know what, friends? America's got more issues than a magazine subscription. Would you agree with me about that tonight? But having said that, we are still the greatest nation on earth. Amen. And when's the last time that we hear preachers get up to the pulpit and don't just emphasize the negative, but remind us of what we have in Him, in our country? Listen, this is a wonderful place to be. And listen, uh, bleeding red, white, and blue won't get you to heaven, but I'll tell you what, I'm glad that I'm a Christian and an American both. I have the best of both worlds. I have a personal relationship with Christ and I'm also a patron. And I thank God for America. And my philosophy is, listen, if you don't like the United States, you go and move somewhere else. We wish you stayed. Yeah. Yeah. 
Matter of fact, if you're like me, I wish some of these people had threatened to move and made good on their threats. Yeah. We don't need you. And I thank God for the United States of America. We've got issues and problems. And I don't need to rehearse all that tonight. I have a message that I preach called What in the World is Going On? that talks about the problems with America. I believe it's a message that needs to be preached. We need to be preached. But you know what? I want to be sensitive to the needs of each individual church. I don't, I don't believe this is what we need to hear tonight. I believe that you as folks here at Montgomery Baptist Church that stick by the stuff, and day in, day out, week in and week out, faithful to the house of God, faithful to the things of God, you need some encouragement. Listen, I want to say this to you as well. It's just us here tonight, okay? We're just being transparent. So let me talk to you as a friend of a friend. You need to understand that when you look around you and you see empty pews here at Montvale, and listen, I, I don't say that to be a, a critique. I don't say that to be judgmental. I say it to be observational. I look around me and there are empty pews here. Uh, also, although the crowd is great tonight, we're encouraged by it. We really are. At the same time, there are more empty pews here tonight than filled. That's not a Montdale Baptist problem. That's a church in America problem. Especially churches that preach and teach the Word of God. Now I'm not saying that every church that preaches the truth is struggling with numbers. Nor am I saying that every church that has a large congregation is compromising. I'm not saying that. Not every TV ministry is evil. Not every large church is a compromising megachurch. God has blessed some. But there's a lot of churches just like Montvale that are struggling. And so we want you to leave here encouraged. I don't care if you're 80. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, or 4 or 5, however old you are tonight. We want you to leave here encouraged. And I believe this passage of Scripture will do that for you. We're here in Mark 10. You know the story. Look at verse 46. Verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he, meaning Jesus, went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, heard that name before? The son of Timaeus sat by the highway side, begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. That's a Bible way of saying, shut up, be quiet. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and got his attention and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Hey, what can I do for you? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Look at verse 47 again. Verse 47 and verse 48 has a phrase that's repeated where blind Bartimaeus says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Friend, would you agree with me tonight that we need the mercy of God? How many of you tonight are grateful for the mercy of Almighty God? How many of you tonight have availed yourself of God's mercy today. Friend, God's mercy is something that we are not to presume upon, yet at the same time, we don't go forward without it. We have to have it. Lamentations 3 says this, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. <clears throat> Do you know the first time that I failed God, if he'd have wanted to do it, he could have struck me down where I stood and be a nice little tidy pile of ash right where Barry used to be. He could have done that and would have been justified in doing so. But he didn't. I want to talk to you tonight for a few moments along this, this line. The wonderful mercy of God. Will you pray with me? 
Father, help us tonight to be reminded of an attribute of You that is beyond description and is priceless. Father, were it not for the mercy of God, the kind compassion of God, we wouldn't be here tonight. We would not be able to draw air into our lungs, put one foot in front of the other one, do anything, much less preach a message. And Father, maybe there's somebody in the service tonight or someone listening uh, or will listen to the, the YouTube re recording of this sermon later on who has never experienced Your mercy and salvation. Lord, would You help them to understand that Titus 3.5, Your Word says this. I didn't say it. You said it. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Maybe there's someone here tonight who has never realized that he's a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, You know this because You're omniscient that most of the world believes that You've got a huge cosmic scale in heaven. And if your good outweighs your bad, then everybody gets in. But Lord, Your Word tells us the problem with that is there's none righteous, no, not one. There are none that are inherently good but You. Therefore, our efforts at goodness, according to Isaiah 64, are as filthy rags. Father, help folks to understand who may be here who are not sure, or may be listening who are not sure, that salvation is not about what we can do. It's about what Jesus already did. Not baptism. Not good works. Not church membership. Not tithing or praying or reading the Bible or even being a witness or serving the church. All those things are things that we do because we are saved, not to get saved. It must be a realization of the need of Jesus and placing one's faith and trust in the shed blood of Christ believing that He died and was buried and rose again for the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of the soul. Father, maybe there's somebody here tonight as a believer who needs to avail himself of the mercy of God in his life. Maybe there's someone here tonight who's a silent rebel and is running from You. Maybe there's a sin issue represented here tonight that needs to be confessed and forsook. Lord, maybe there's a believer here tonight who has been beating himself up black and blue with guilt over past mistakes. And that person has allowed the devil to replay his failures in the Blu-ray player of his mind over and over and over again. Father, would you please comfort his heart tonight or her heart and help these folks to understand that your mercy is new every morning and when it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Father, help them. And for all of us that need encouragement, would you please provide tonight as only you can. And we'll give you the honor and glory for it. And Jesus is always claiming Isaiah 55, 11 that says, Your word will not return unto you void, but it will prosper in the purpose for which you send it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, i got to tell you tonight, my heart's a little heavy tonight. This has been a rough day in the Daniel family. Uh, after I went home last night after preaching, I had traveled from Lexington, North Carolina yesterday after, from a meeting and was back here last night, went home to rest and take it easy. And we had a, a dog named Molly. She's a little Pomeranian. She was 11 years of age, about that big, but she thinks she's about six foot tall, you know, uh, a giant killer. Uh, her heart encompassed preacher about 80% of her chest cavity. She had a mi mitocardial condition that was leading to... Uh, congestive heart failure, and her heart was so enlarged that it was pushing on her lungs and her diaphragm. We've known about this for about two years. Uh, Molly had a real, real rough night last night, and we didn't get much rest at all. And she, she didn't want to lay down because it's sometimes when she lays down, it presses everything and she can't breathe well. And so today we got up and we took her to the vet, and to make a long story short, we had to put her dog to sleep this morning. And so, uh, we, we know that dogs are not humans. We know that, that, that humans are made in the image of God. And that if He cares for the sparrows and the tree and the, the grass and the field, how much more does He care for us? But the Bible also says this, the righteous man regards the life of his beast. 
And you know, my wife has said this before, and I believe she's on to something that you can learn something about a person about the way that they treat animals. That, that I believe there is some validity to that. And uh, I have no idea. I would never preach and say that animals go to heaven, but if God wants to surprise me by her being there, I'm just fine with that, all right? But having said that, here's what I noticed when I went to the vet today. Several years ago, my wife lost a, a, a pet that she had raised from the day it was born, a cat. And I saw a devastation that I'd never seen before. And I saw an animal be put down, and I hated it, and I thought, I don't want to ever see that again. But we went through it today, and although it was bad, it was not as bad as the first time. And preacher, here's why. When they put that catheter on her leg, and they put that sleeping agent into her body that, uh, that kind of is a precursor to what they give the, the animal to actually allow the animal to pass away. I'm telling you, as soon as that sleeping agent hit her bloodstream, she crumpled and was gone. And I believe that probably she passed even before the other agents were applied. Say, Brother Barry, why do you say Because it was quick, listen to me, and it was merciful. It was merciful. And we didn't have to endure that for minutes and minutes and minutes. And she didn't have to endure it. Friends, you ever thought about the fact of how merciful God is to you and to me? Somebody once said that mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And let's set the record straight here tonight. Everybody in this room deserves a place called hell. Now, I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm not trying to be cruel or mean. But all of humanity has rejected God in and of Himself. There's none that seeketh after God, Romans tells us. Psalm says the same thing. You're not saved because you sought God. You're saved because God sought you. And the Bible tells us in John that the Father draws all men to Himself. Listen, the heartbeat of God are the souls of men. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? 1 Timothy 2.4 Who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Peter 3.9 says, He loved the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, I don't have a Calvinist moment in my body, and neither does Jesus. He liked to see everyone get saved. Amen. But mercy goes beyond not just getting what we deserve. The word mercy also means kindness. It means compassion. Friend, have you experienced the compassion of God in your life? Have you experienced the kindness of God in your life? Why is it that we heap that mercy of God to ourselves? We heap it, we crave it, we beg for it. But yet we can't live for Him as we are. Why is it that revival is like pulling teeth? But yet we want all the perks and pleasures of being a child of God. Friend, I'm grateful for the mercy of God. And here's a story in Scripture that I believe illustrates the wonderful mercy of our Lord. Will you look at it with me in a little bit more detail? First thing that I want you to see today is mercy required. Look at verse 46 again. It says, And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people blind Bartimaeus. The son of Timaeus sat by the highway side begging. Friend, I want to tell you this tonight, whether you realize it or not, and I'm assuming that most, if not all, do, but just in case you don't, because the worst thing that a preacher can do is presume on what anybody knows. That's why when your preacher preaches, when Brother Earl preaches the Word of God, when I preach the Word of God, that's why I give the Gospel and try to give the Gospel each and every time that I preach because I don't presume on anybody. The only person I know that's saved is me. And even in my life, I've gone through bouts of doubt. Maybe you have as well, alright? But let me say this. Number one, mercy required. You need the mercy of God. You have to have it. If it's not for the mercy of God, you will not make it in your life. Now I'm going to say this, of the, almost of the 8 billion people on planet earth, whether they realize it, whether they recognize it, and whether they praise God for it or not, they are alive and above ground because of the mercy of God. Every time a God denier puts one foot in front of the other one, it's the mercy of God. 
Every time a God blasphemer shakes his fist in God's face and gives a black eye to the cause of Jesus Christ, you know what? It's the mercy of God that he's not consumed. When Jesus hung on that cross and they said, He saved others, Himself He cannot save. Let, let's leave Him alone. Let's see if anybody will come to save Him. Let's see if He comes out off that cross. And Jesus could have looked at each one of them and He could have said, Listen, cease to exist. And they would have all been gone. Poor God for mercy of God. We sing the song He could have called 10,000 angels. I'll sing it myself. To destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and for me. Friend, I want to tell you something. He didn't need one angel. He could have taken care of all of it with a thought. Number one, I want you to see this. Bartimaeus was blind. He needed help. Friend, listen. There weren't, as far as I know anyway, there weren't welfare programs back then. There wasn't disability. And even if there was, it would been turned down the first time. Amen? <laughs> there, there wasn't Social Security. People's families took care of them or they didn't have anything. He was blind. He couldn't see. I want to tell you something. Like there's two kinds of people in the world. No, not Redskins and Cowboys fans. <laughs> By the way, if you're a Cowboy fan, this altar is open for you. All right? <laughs> And the Lord will forgive you for your last name. Two kinds of people in the world, not Republicans and Democrats. There's two kinds of people in the world. There are those that see and those that are blind. And by the way, you and I ought never to be spiritual snobs where we walk around with our nose so far from the air that we can tell the texture of the clouds. And we walk around, we think we're better than everybody else. And you know, I'm a preacher, I'm Dr. Big Britches, and I've got more degrees than a thermometer, all this kind of thing. For we are cold and callous, and we think we're better than people. Listen, I mentioned this last night. I'll say it again. Somebody once said, you can be as theologically clear as ice and twice as cold. The only difference between a lost person and a saved person, between us and them, if you will, is that you can see. The scales have come off. You were blind. Listen, nobody was born with spiritual sight. God's the one that has to... Hey, Lord's calling you, brother. You better listen, all right? <laughs> no one is born with spiritual sight. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians 4 puts it this way. It says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of those who believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus would shine through. Question for you, friend. When's the last time as a believer that you thank God for your spiritual discernment? When's the last time that you thank God that when you open your Bible you could actually make heads and tails of what you were reading? When's the last time that you thank God that when you're listening to that TV preacher and he says something that doesn't gel with the Word of God and the warning lights go off in your mind because the Holy Spirit, who's the greatest Bible teacher who ever lived, spoke to your heart and gave you clear guidance and discernment. When's the last time that we thank God that though we were blind, now we can see. Or this was blind. Physically. How many of you, your eyes are getting worse the older that you live? Here's what I have caught myself doing, brother, over the last two years. A lot of times, I'll take my glasses and I'll put them on top of my head. Now, I read better with my glasses off. Some of you are the opposite. You read better with your glasses on. But for me, when I take my glasses off, the words pop like a pop-up book for a kid. I'm, I'm, I'm nearsighted. I'll wear my glasses when I, when I used to play softball. I'd wear my glasses when I play the outfield. I'll wear glasses when I drive. When I was in college, I'd be sitting in chapel and I could not distinguish the, the facial features of the speaker. So I'd sit there and I would squint and I had my glasses. But here's what my eye doctor encouraged me, encouraged me with. He said, the older you get, it's going to get worse on both ends. <laughs> well, thank you, doctor. Come here and I need to smack your face. <laughs> if somebody said, Brother Barry, you've got to lose one of your senses. Choose now. Quick, quick. I would never choose my eyes. I want to see. Man, Martha, this what to see. 
Now, I don't know in context, I don't want to allegorize everything. In context, he was wanting to see physically. He was blind. Oh, he needed mercy, didn't he? Number one, he was blind. Look at your Bible. Second of all, I want you to see. Number two, he was begging. He was begging. Now, let me say this. I want to, I want to pause here for a moment. Again, Bartimaeus evidently didn't have any kind of a familial system around him that provided for his needs. If you reach the point in your life where you are begging for something to eat, or begging for food, you know, you have set aside your pride and you have come to your wit's end. Now, everybody in here has an opinion about panhandlers in Rome. I live in Garden City, and when I'm getting off of 220 off the Franklin Road exit, there's a median right there with a sign on it that says, don't panhandle. If you need help, call such and such number. The people that stand there will take their book bags and crisscross them over that sign so nobody can see them. But listen, friend, I'm not naive. I understand that people run scams. I also understand that sometimes people work together in cahoots and probably make good money panhandling. But let me tell you something. If God lays it on your heart to show mercy to one of those folks, then you do it. Well, Brother Barry, what if he goes and buys beer or alcohol? Friend, listen, what he does with the money is his problem, not yours. The Bible says in 1 John, if I see a brother or sister destitute of food or of daily clothes, and I say to him, depart and be ye filled no more, but I do nothing to put food in his belly or clothes on his back, and it's within my power to do so, then how dwells the love of God in me? Now I know in context, that's referring to a Christian to a Christian, but shouldn't it also apply to how we treat everybody? Yeah. Jesus is merciful to everybody! The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. You remember the little Looney Tune cartoons where the characters would run around and the rain cloud would fall on them they went? When's the last time you saw two farms and one farm was owned by a believer and the other farm was owned by a lost man and the rain was only falling on the Christian farm? No! God sends rain to us all in His mercy. If somebody needs something God that prompts your heart to give, then you do it. And you let him sort out the rest of it. Now it's free. Friend, we are all beggars. I heard Mark Lowry, a Christian comedian, once say this. He said, a Christian is simply a beggar who has found bread leading other beggars to food. That's good, isn't it? This man required mercy. And everybody in this room, spiritually speaking, was blind and begging. By the way, now there's some of us in this room and we've been in the place physically where we were almost maybe uh, a notch or two away from begging. Uh, maybe we've had some illnesses where we almost lost some of our senses or had terrible dire health needs and on the brink of perhaps even death and God pulled us back. Number one, we've seen mercy required. But number two, I want you to see this. I want you to see mercy recognized. In verse number 50, 47 and 48, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 48 made charge that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't ask the disciples for mercy. He didn't call Peter's name. He didn't call John or James or Andrew or Philip or Bartholomew. Most certainly didn't call Judas. He called the name of Jesus. He recognized the one who was merciful. You ever heard the old adage that there are no atheists in foxholes? Isn't it amazing that people when they're in dire straits and they're hanging on to the last knot of the rope, all of a sudden God becomes real. Yeah. And by the way, He was real all along. Somebody once said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's bad theology. God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not. Yeah. This man recognized, number one, 
he recognized the Lordship of Jesus. You're the Messiah. Jesus means, listen, Jehovah is salvation. It's the same word that we get the Hebrew word, Joshua. He said, you are the salvation. You are the deliverer. And so this man, he couldn't see with his eyeballs, but he had a little bit of discernment. He recognized, although he couldn't see him physically, he recognized there was something about Jesus. And by the way, let me say this tonight. Nobody followed Jesus because of what he looked like. No one followed Christ because of his physical prowess or because of his handsomeness or because he had some type of physical profile that was appealing. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us opposite. Isaiah says he had no form nor comeliness that we should desire Him. If you had a lineup of Jewish men here tonight, chances are you couldn't pick Jesus out of them. People didn't follow Him for what He said. I mean, excuse me, what He looked like. They followed Him for what He said what He did. Yeah. He spoke not as the scribes and Pharisees, for He taught as one who had authority. And He said, Jesus, number one, He recognized Him as Lord. But number two, He recognized His lineage. The Bible says, Jesus, thou son of David, You know, God made promises to certain men in Scripture. We use the word covenant. He made a covenant with David. By the way, David's my favorite Bible character. I, I make no qualms about that. I, I'm going to tell you why I love David. David was a lying, deceiving, adulterous murderer. But God said he was a man in my own heart. First yeah. hope for David, there's hope for me. Amen? Just man falls seven times that he rises again. God told David, they will never fail you a man to sit on your throne. An unconditional Davidic covenant, which by the way, will have its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Himself. Where Christ will sit on the Davidic throne and rule and reign. It will be called the millennial reign. And when that thousand year reign's over, that's just the warm up for eternity. He's going to rule and reign for King of Kings and Lord of Lords when the calendar and the clock is thrown out the window. And this man recognized his lineage. Friend, I want to tell you something. Allah will not give you mercy. You can cry unto Him until your throat hurts. Friend, I want to tell you, remember the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings? They cried to Baal, which by the way is nothing more than demon worship. They cried to him and they cut themselves until the blood gushed out, which, by the way, also a sign of demon worship. And they said, Please, oh, will you please come and consume the sacrifice? And Elijah said, Well, listen, maybe you need to talk louder. He got sarcastic with them. He said, Well, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to talk a little bit louder. And they prayed and they cried and they cut like wild men with confusion and chaos. And Elijah said, What prayer? He said, will you please come down and consume the sacrifice? And the God of heaven, Jehovah, the, the one who self-exists, the self-existing one, the one who never had day one, who never have a day done, he consumed the flame, he consumed the sacrifice, he consumed the rocks, he consumed the water around him, and God was victorious. Amen. Because when you call on the name of Jesus, yeah. things happen. Amen. There are people in Israel right now they are begging at the wailing wall for the Messiah to come. It's already been here. The blind Lord of Aeneas could see more than we realize. We've seen mercy required. We've seen mercy recognized. And by the way, who knows this? He didn't care who hurt him. People said, calm down, be quiet. And he got louder. Can I tell you about the best beating I ever got in my life as a kid? I said, Brother Barry, what do you mean? I'm sitting in a, I'm sitting in the Kroger parking lot with my sister. <coughs> and she did something I didn't like. And I'm not saying I was right for doing this. I'm, this is not good. I got mad and I reached over and I went, Bip. I didn't. Just went, Bip. And I caught her just right, and her nose began to bleed. She had me. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Buddy, you're dead. 
Yeah. And she began to cry. I saw her. Her name's Blaine. I said, Blaine, please, please be quiet. Ah, the more and more I the louder, the more I beg, the louder she died. Because she knew she had me right home. And my mom, when we went, she, she took us to my grandma's house, and she didn't have anything else, so she gave us a flip flop. Probably the only fact that I ever got, I didn't feel. I never understood people who got who put books down their pants. My, my parents would never let that slide. My mom would say, why'd you pull the book off the shelf and move it when it was nice and neat and I got extra for that, all right? He didn't care to hear him cry. He said, shh, I said, shh. He cried without her. For me, the mercy of God, it doesn't matter. He knows it. We're all in the same spiritual boat. I don't care how much money you have or influence. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't even care how quote unquote how spiritual you are. You never get to the point where you outgrow the mercy of God for us. He begged for it. Mercy required, mercy recognized. But number three, I want you to see mercy's response. Number 49, excuse me, verse 49, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said, what can I do for you? Friend, can I tell you something tonight? When you ask Jesus for mercy, when you beg God for something, you are not bothering Him. My mom will be gone a year this coming Sunday, and I've heard her say things over the years that she was a godly woman, loved the Lord. But I've heard her say some things, well, I don't want to ask too much. I don't want to... I don't want to do this. I said, Mama, listen. It's okay to ask for any and all things according to His will. Mm-hmm. What First John says? It says we have this confidence. Being confident of this very thing. That if we pray anything according to His will, that He heareth us. And if He heareth us, then we also have the petitions that we desire. For him. Ask and He shall receive. Seek and He shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened on you. Jesus is not a cosmic Santa Claus. We don't sit on his lap and he offer a, a, a cosmic wish list. He doesn't pull out the blank check and say, hey, put in as many zeros as you like. But he always gives us what we need, and sometimes he gives us what we want. Psalm 37 says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. A very misinterpreted verse. What that means is when I walk in with him, my wants match his wants, and therefore he fulfills them. Yeah. That's what it means. And Jesus says, What can I do for you? I think of James 1 5 preacher that says this If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. In other words, God's not offended that you ask of him. It's about the only good use of the word liberal that I can think of. He gives all men liberally. God's throwing out wisdom like candy for those who ask for it. And they said that I might receive my sight. Look what it says here before he says, He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. For in blind Bartimaeus recognized who he was talking to. And he made Jesus his Lord. So, Brother Barry, how do you know Bartimaeus got saved? We don't find his prayer. Folks, I want to tell you something. Where in the Bible does it say you've got to pray to be saved? Nor in the Bible does it say you have to say three or four certain things in an order and a verbal prayer, or God will not save you. The Bible doesn't say that. Romans 10 13 says this For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the next verse says this How shall they call on whom they do not believe? In other words, when you call on God verbally, it's an evidence of what you've already believed in your heart. How about Paul on the Damascus Road? He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul got saved right there. 
This man got saved. He came looking for his sight. But he left being saved. Look at verse 52. Not only mercy's response, but mercy's reception. Verse 52. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And friend, you can be sure and take it to the bank that when Jesus healed someone physically, he was more concerned to heal them spiritually. And immediately he received his sight. And follow Jesus in the way. He got his sight, and the first thing he did was he didn't go to McDonald's. He didn't even go to his family. The Bible says he followed Jesus in the way. Except now he can see. What a wonderful story of the mercy of God. What's the application for you and for me tonight? You cannot survive without the mercy of God. It's impossible. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. The word new literally means fresh. The Bible says in Psalms, all that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of man. Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. Amen. For I want to tell you something. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you've never put your faith in Jesus. And by the way, being a Christian is not just believing in the facts of God's Word. It's receiving it in your heart and where it changes your life. See, if you're saved tonight, either God saved you from a bunch of stuff or He saved you out of a bunch of stuff. Either way, He changed your life. That's what it means. And God in His mercy will save you tonight. If you're a believer tonight and there's a sin issue in your life, can I tell you something? The blood of Jesus Christ has already positionally cleansed you from everything that you've ever done that you're doing now or that you will do. First John 1 says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But to maintain fellowship with God and to have His peace and power and purpose instilled in our life and be well, we've got to confess that to Him. And maybe you're here tonight and there's a sin issue in your life. You need to confess it not to me. It's not my business. Not to the preacher, but to God. And forsake it so that revival can go to you in this church. Let me say this. Man, well, I, I'm really speaking to myself now. We need to reflect the mercy of God to others. We want God's mercy in buckets. But we give it in feathers. Whether it be the line of Walmart, which will test the patience of any saint of God. <laughs> Whether it be in traffic in Rome. And by the way, preacher, I could never live in Chicago or New York or Dallas because the traffic in Rome drives me up a wall. I can't imagine. Friend, we're not very merciful. We want it. And by the way, how about when we stop our own? How about when we appear almost glad? When a brother or sister falls, I knew it. I knew that was too good to be true. Why is it we enjoy the comeuppance that people get? You think God enjoys dealing out judgment? Why do we? See, if we're to be like Jesus, and Jesus is merciful, then ought not the Holy Spirit of God to produce that in our lives as well? In the way that we deal with people? Friend, listen to me. I'm speaking to me. Because it's real easy to get up and hammer sin. But it's a supernatural act of God to be merciful to people in your life. We need that. The wonderful mercy of God. Don't presume on it. But don't proceed without it. Pray with me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment. I want to give you a moment to respond to the Word of God. And please, no one, no one looking around for just a moment will be done. You've listened so well. It's so much easier and more fun to preach when folks are with you and paying attention. And more importantly, when you do that, you receive more from the Word of God because you're engaged in the service.
You're to be committed to that. And I wonder with heads bowed and eyes closed, would there be somebody here tonight and say, Brother Barry, I know that I'm in need of the mercy of God and, and I'm just not sure that I'm a Christian. I don't have Bible assurance that I'm saved, that I'm born again. I know that my sin separates me from God and I deserve hell because God in His holiness cannot look on sin. Friend, it's not that a God of love sends people to hell. It's that our sin sends us there. Somebody once said that every sinner goes to hell unsaved, but no sinner goes to hell unloved. Anybody here tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed say, Brother Barry, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian, but I want to know for sure. I want to make sure. I want to settle it. You slip your hand up so we can pray for you. We won't embarrass you. We wouldn't call you by name and have folks look at you and point you out. That's not what we're about. But we would like to pray for you. I have no idea who's listening or who will be listening tonight from home or abroad or wherever. But friend, let me say this. You can settle the salvation of your soul the matter right where you sit in your home. There's nothing magical or mystical about being inside of a church building to get saved. If you say, well, I'll wait till the next time I'm in a church and then I'll get right with God, that next time may never come. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And right where you sit, you can bow your head in faith and express to Christ that you realize that you're a sinner, but that you believe in your heart that Jesus died and was buried and rose again for your sin. And that right now you receive Him as your Savior to forgive you of your sin and to save your soul. Friend, if you'll do that in faith, not that your word saved, but what Jesus did saves, if you'll believe on Him, He is promised, He is obligated by His very word to save your soul tonight. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that He died once for all, and therefore when you're saved, you're saved once for all. And it's an eternal contract between you and God. If you're not saved tonight, and even at home, will you make sure Friend, here's my next question. I wonder if there's a believer here tonight and say, Brother Barry, to be honest, there's some things in my life between me and God that aren't right. And I need to confess some sin issues to Him that are hindering me. The Bible says, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will there be a believer who not even raise his hand or her hand and say, Brother Barry, there's some issues in my life that are between me and God. And I need to take a moment and do business with Him. Anyone like that at all here tonight? Some things in my heart that aren't right where I need the mercy of God tonight. How many of you would say this, Brother Barry? I'm not being arrogant. I sin every day. I keep I try to keep a zero count of my sin with God. I'm not perfect, but as far as I know, things are right between my soul and the Savior, and I'm leaving church tonight because I'm right with God. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord for you. That's not arrogant. That's confidence in Him, and it's the end goal. It's what we want. We want you to be right with Him. How many would say this? Brother Barry, God spoke to my heart tonight, and I have not been merciful to others as I ought. I've been holding them to a standard that I don't meet myself. I have expected the mercy of God in my life while withholding it from others around me. And God spoke to my heart about being a more merciful person to the people in my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand tonight? Anyone like, yes, sir, thank you for your honesty. Anybody else? God spoke to my heart about being more merciful and forgiving in my dealings as God is with me. Yes, ma'am, thank you for that. Anybody else? My last question is this, as we close our meeting, or at least the part on my part where I turn it over to the preacher. To be a believer would say, Brother Barry, I want to tell you, we only, although we only had two nights, the Word of God has genuinely encouraged my heart. And I am aware of the device of discouragement of Satan but I can tell you that I'm leaving God's house like with a renewed encouragement that I want to keep on feeding in the days and weeks and years to come. If that's you, would you raise your hand? 
all over the church building. Thank God for you. Father, thank you for your word and how it has worked once again. Thank you for your mercy, not giving us what we deserve, but giving us what we don't deserve, which is a home in heaven through your grace. Thank you for your kindness and compassion on Bartimaeus, on me, on every person in this world. Thank you, brother. That was...